Good afternoon, welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. Um, as Messrs Leonardo and some guy called Joe meet down the road from me at the ICC, we're here to talk all things Celtic. So if you want to take yourself away from the, the crazy movie set that is just now Glasgow in the middle of a climate summit, here we are to talk about the, the men in green. Uh, another men in green, not green credentials that is, but we'll be talking about green credentials and Celtic later on, so stay tuned for that. But gentlemen... Yes. See, when you How said the you? Rado, I thought you were going to say Raphael, Michelangelo, and it was going to be the Turtles <laughs> in green. <laughs> but it's something completely different you're talking about, isn't it? It's not the sure Teenage is. Ninja Mutant Turtles or whatever. No, maybe Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles might have come up with a better deal. But anyway, Patrick, how are we? Great. Um, not the best result on Saturday, but still doing well. Looking forward to the game on Thursday. How are you? Yes. I'm all right. Um, everything's a bit crazy just now when you step out the door, but yes, I'm fine. Um, we'll go right to, to Celtic Park on Saturday. Um, it was a, a tough one to take for all of us. I think we all went into the game quite optimistic after a really good performance at Easter Road on the Wednesday, um, something that Lawrence practically predicted. He, I think you said four goals at Easter Road, and I was taken aback by it, but you weren't far off, and it probably could have yep. been four plus in the first half. Um but we played well at Easter Road and Wednesday. It was a great performance and a great result. But then Saturday happened. Um, Patty, I'm going to come to you first on this. We've saw many a team come to Celtic Park and play a low block. So Johnson very similarly played a low block against us. Um, we got a break of the ball that led to the first goal, obviously from G.K. Marcus. And then we got a penalty at the end of the game. It's very similar in parts. You know, Celtic with a large chunk of possession. Um, but, you know, in terms of the game plan and how we approach this game. You mentioned something just before we came on in about the amount of crosses into the box. How frustrated were you on Saturday with the amount of times that we tried to repeat the same thing and it just didn't work? Incredibly. Especially because of the people who were crossing the ball. I think you, you, you have the four main players, Jovanovic, Jota, Abada and Ralston. And it was only really Jota putting in any crosses of any quality. Ralston is limited in that area going forward. Uh, Jovanovic has to turn back on his right foot. He can't, when he's got all the momentum behind him going forward, he can't hit across. He needs to turn back and cross with his right. And then Abad has just been, you know, he's gone totally off the boil recently and his crossing was pretty poor, I thought, as well. So you're effectively left with Jota. And I think I said to you it was 81 crosses over the two games. Mm. And I'm not sure how many were successful, but none of them resulted in goals, that's for sure. Lawrence, one of the things a lot of people had said in its defence at the, the Tony Macaroni when we played there and were beaten was that we didn't really have anybody to get on the end of those cross balls. But on Saturday, we started with our, our new Greek striker, Giacomakis, and we just, you know, it just couldn't seem the big boy in the middle for Livingston. Just dealt with absolutely everything, really. Um, what, what was your thoughts on it and the way in which we had to try to break down Livingston? Um, because I thought at times we should have stretched them a lot more. We should have tried to make them a lot more tired, but um, yeah, it just I thought we could have played there until the clocks went back and even get the extra one still not scored a goal. Yeah, de- definitely like a bad ninety minutes for us. I mean, Starfield uh, had one header from across. They should have should have got on target. You know, it was almost a free header. He loses his man and he's been over the bar with it. I mean, that is it is kind of hard to to think of who else got on across, isn't it? It's. We miss Big Tom. We know we're thread, but Ange has already said he needs to improve his attacking midfield options. Uh, so, you know, it, it felt a tumble, I suppose, to, to do that for us, to step up to the mark. You know, it wasn't just him that's not stepped up. Yeah, Marcus, uh, you know, he's lucky if he's, he's played three games of football. You know, all in. I don't think he's done 270 minutes yet for us. And mm. he looked way off the pace, didn't he? He's... His penalty probably the least said about it the best, the, the better rather. I mean, I don't, I'm not a big fan of two step run ups, uh, it, particularly poor penalty. And even after that, he's got a chance, you know, James, he miss hits it. You'd ex- he almost gets to the end there, he puts it wide. Uh, yeah, definitely frustrating for us. I'm bad I didn't, didn't look good again. But on, on the plus side, we get Jamesy back, he gets some minutes in his legs, you know. Uh, which was good for us. Yeah, we did see the, the return of James Forrest, Patrick. Um, 
In terms of the end of the game, obviously Postacoglu definitely did go for it. I almost looked like a 4 2 4 that we were playing at the end of the game as if we were playing that old formation that we've had um, a lot of uh, historical success with. Um, but it just wouldn't come. And even with the amount of atta- attackers on the park, the 85% possession that we had in the game, it just wouldn't come. Um, again, what, what do you think is the biggest lesson to learn from this game? Because a lot of teams, Livingston won't be the only team that'll be happy to come to Celtic Park, park the bus and take the point. I, I, it's a combination of things. I don't think every team will be that lucky because, you know, we get a penalty that we didn't score. Their keeper made a few fantastic saves. And the the ten outfield players or the nine outfield players in the last three minutes, they're pretty good at what they do. They're pretty good at defending. Um, you know, other teams aren't that good. We've seen that with Dundee and St. Mum. Um you know, I think, you know, the the ticker tape at the bottom says it we we really, really miss Rogic. You know, he he went off after about forty three minutes against Tibbs and we didn't really do anything after the forty third minute. No. I mean, we didn't do anything that exciting against Livingston either. We had two or three shots in target. One of them was a penalty, you know. So I think, you know, we're looking at, we're, we're probably having to look at different options in there because, as you say, we went to two in the middle, you know, Turnbull and McGregor, because mm. only two creative players we've got, really. I don't think there was anyone on the bench, you know. Brought on Mikey Johnson for Jota. I was a bit confused by that, to be honest, because I thought Jota was our only sort of creative outlet look. for most mm. of the game. Um, you know, it makes the transfer window a bit baffling because we got rid of two of our four attacking midfielders. Uh, I know they both probably wanted to leave, but it's we didn't really replace any of them, you know. So baffling, and you know, one week we're top of the world, the other week we've got massive surgery needed. So maybe a bit of perspective, but it is slightly worrying when you've got eighty five percent possession, about forty crosses, but you've only got two shots in target. Yeah, it might be a, a, a bit of perspective, Lawrence. But we knew this season was not going to be smooth going. It was going to be a roller coaster. Um, as Patrick mentions there, and Tom Rogic, him dropping out, you know, the game in, in Wednesday, we didn't really do much creatively after he, he went off injured. And then his uh, missing, missing an action on Saturday, we also, again, really did miss him. Um, one of the comments coming through uh, from somebody, I've just lost it there, JC, that's here. I don't blame Ange players have to take responsibility. Now, something that we'd spoken about a couple of weeks ago, I think, was that, you know, the, the way in which Postacoglu wants his players to play football, they just might have not been executing it to the standard that was expected. You know, when we came back after an international break, we started wrapping up those results uh, against Motherwell, Ferenc Varos, St Johnston, um, and then obviously Hibs. Is there a possibility that in, in Saturday, you know, the manager had his instructions and everything else correct, but it was just the players not on song in the game that was what cost us or do you think it's a balance of both? Probably a bit of balance of both. I mean, Turnbull gave a great ball over to Yota. He tries to do it first time. You know, he's, what, seven or eight yards out in space at the back post. He's got time to take it down and he's only keep it to beat. You'd expect him to score if he takes it, takes the touch and sets himself. He doesn't. He goes for the spectacular and, and just messes it up. Yakimakis, you know, we're st- I think we're still... He's looked good when he's come on for the last 15, 20 minutes, but he's not looked good over 90. Uh, so whether he's suffering, because he's not played a lot of football since May, whether he needs to get up to speed, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, it, was all, it wasn't an inspiring performance from your centre forward, was it? Uh, mm. I mean, it even, you know, penalty aside, you know, that late miss, when James miss hits it, you're, you're thinking you should be getting this in target, and he it, it, it doesn't. So, yeah, maybe a bit of both. But listen, the manager's already identified he needs another attacking midfielder. He's come out and said it. So he, so he knows where he's, I suppose, the team's weak, which hopefully means that you know, we're doing the, doing the work at, ahead of the transfer window open. We've got already got a few targets for that position identified. Yeah, hopefully we, we do have that nailed down and we're not doing our, our same old Patrick, What are these comments coming in from Ian in the comments? 13 points from a possible 15 in October. Positivity required by the fans. Um, we did say during the last international break that, you know, this was a really tough run of fixtures coming up. Even getting into the game pre-international break at Pitaudry. Um It was not doomsday, but it was it looking that we were in the best of shapes. So obviously, we hadn't uh, won a game on the road before we went to Pitaudry. We came back after international break. We saw it was a tough run of fixtures. 
um, and it's 13 from a possible 15, two dropped. Have we just slightly gone ahead of ourselves because results have went either way and there's that, you know, hesitation to kick ourselves because we know that, you know, had we probably played to our potential, it would only be two points at this moment in time or is it just perspective and that we're still on a journey here, we're still very early in the stages of post the Celtic reign and that this is by no means a finished article? Yeah, I, I think Ian makes a good point. You know, four wins in a draw out of five games, I'd take that in every five-game block because um, I think you're probably winning the league on that form. I think it's just a bit demoralising because you've had the boost against Motherwell where we've cut the gap from six to four. You've then had another boost with Hibs where you've cut the gap from four to two. You play it before Rangers so you can actually go a point clear and you put a, a lot of pressure on them to turn up at Motherwell. And, you know, what happens at Motherwell? You know, Motherwell don't turn up at all on the, on the day. But it's it's an opportunity missed and you can't help but be a bit demoralised to to look at that and think, you know, this is... It, it's extremely disappointing. Not only that, when you analyse the game, you know, two shots on target. You, you know, Postacoglu said a few weeks ago he doesn't pop champagne corks for clean sheets. He, what, what he wants is to limit the opponent's chances and... We've done that pretty well, you know. We, I don't think we conceded a shot on target. I think their XG must have been next to nothing because of that. So we don't look like conceding, but I don't think Livingston were coming to Celtic Park to try and score goals. Mm-hmm. So it's a bit of a balance, you know. We, we needed. I, I think the difficulty was, you know, with Livingston. I think if you get the first goal, two and three come later because they then have to open up. Even if it's in the last twenty minutes, they have to open up. And with their improved fitness levels, you know, if you just get that one goal, the game can be totally different. So I don't think it's, you know, I don't think the trains come off the tracks. There isn't some massive disaster, but it is demoralising. If you probably looked at the, the two games um, when we were last on last Tuesday and you said Easter Road and at home at Livingston, if you were maybe offered four points at some stage of the season, probably going back a year ago um, due to our form at Easter Road, you would probably actually expect four points, winning the game at home and actually taking something at Easter Road. Um, so as you say, the train's not completely came off the tracks. It's not a complete disaster. It's just, I think it's just the fact that you've played so well in one of the games at a very tough venue. You've got the monkey off your back after seven years not winning there in the league. And then, you know, the, the game that you're probably expected to go and win and put on a show, you've not. So I think that's where the the, the sticking point is. Lawrence, one of the points here from, from Paul in the comments is you think you can blame and you guys, it's been a system. Uh, this is the system that he brings on Kyogre but left the zero impact J.K. Mack is on. He did not stick, I think I meant to say stick to the system. Um, again, though, but when I actually looked at the team sheet, Lawrence, I thought he's playing the big guy up front because I'm maybe going to play a wee bit more route one football because we know Livingston's very hard to break down through the middle and we're going to stretch it and get it into the wide areas. But again, we didn't really do that. So uh, is it just, you know, it's... You know, when you look at it, the, the raw basics of it, it's five points dropped against Livingston. So, in terms of, I don't know when we next play Livingston, but what do we do in that next game? Oh, it's going to be a long, long way away, but what is it, what's going to be the game plan then? Well, so it's probably our easiest game in October, and it's the only one we didn't take three points from, which is mm. probably why it's so sad. Kyogo, he went over his ankle kind of in the last 20 minutes <coughs> against Hibs, but although he completed the game, and Yakimakis didn't have a lot of game time, so I thought maybe he's just Try, you know, Gold has played a lot of football. Maybe he's given him a rest. Try to get some Yakimakis up to speed. It obviously didn't work, <laughs> you, you, you know. And hindsight, hindsight's wonderful. You're going to, you know, if we just played Gold through in the middle, we'd have played different and it might or might not have worked. But, you know, it didn't work. And Yakimakis, I thought he looked really off the pace. And I think he said something like, I don't know, 220 minutes of football all, all in, Saturday included. So, it, it, it's a worry, you know, he's a backup striker and he, he just, he didn't look good enough against Livy he, 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 at all. Uh, so, hopefully Andrew doesn't repeat the experiment. I, I, I would hope, you know, we kind of go back to Kyogo uh, starting at, and starting up front. I know he's only got six months as a centre forward before he joined us, but he certainly, that's looked his best position when he's playing for us. And, you know, the, the team seem to be play better when he's playing centre forward, you know, we, like at Ibrox, he started in the left wing, you know, we didn't win, you know, so, so, so you're looking at games where we drop points and it, it's generally that we've not played him through in the middle. 
Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think I think lots of people would agree that he is more natural for the middle. He makes a bigger impact for ourselves for the middle, but again, he is comfortable in playing in the wing, and maybe it's just how you actually uh, suit Giacomakis, and if he is going to play Kyogo for the wing, because it could be the way in which we do this, but again, it's, it just depends on the way that we approach games like this. Patrick, we're seeing two sides of this in the comments, one from your counterpart name here, Patrick Dolan, saying it's a home form that petrifies him, turned up versus Dundee, United, I think that's meant to be Dundee, I had to save your 10 months at Munnan as an Altmar, Ross County, Dundee United, St. George and Livingston, sorry, that is Dundee, we've them 6-0, Kyogo's hat-trick, St. George and Livingston, all very poor, but then we're getting the contrast of that from Stevie saying five wins and a draw listen to yourselves on Wednesday night as a hero Saturday he's getting it stinking where does the balance come in as Patrick people are saying you know at home there's questions to be asked but then Stevie says there you know it's been as you say you probably take what we've had post international break so far if we get a positive result on Thursday evening in Hungary and we beat Dundee at Dens is everything rosy in the garden again? Um, probably uh, yes, I would say so. Actually, uh, I don't think he's getting it stinking. I think anyone who's giving him giving him it stinking is probably overreacting a bit. He's getting criticism because we've dropped points. I think every Celtic manager is going to get that for the rest of time, as long as standards are upheld. Um, but you know, it's it's not a disaster, but at the same time, it's also extremely disappointing. And there's no getting away from either of those facts. You know, people are saying the league's over we four when we're four points behind. On the second of November, that's just not true. Uh, some people are saying it's not a blip at all. I just think that isn't true either. Four points isn't in- insurmountable, but it is. It, it's a it's a sizable enough gap in a title race. So I, I don't think we should be worrying or getting too overconfident either way. Um, the best way to remedy it is to get, as you say, a positive result and then a win uh, at uh, the weekend as well, because. Probably, probably what's expected of us. Uh, it will almost guarantee us conference league football after Christmas, and it will keep us at least within four points at the top of the table. Lawrence Patrick used the word positive there, and Kevin Graham's came in, in the comments to say demoralising is the PLC appointing Mister Higgins not not winning a football game. Now at this point in time, and um, this is only you know it's assumed that um, former. Uh, Police constable, I think Bernard Higgins. That's the chief constable. Uh, yes, is uh, uh, expected to be appointed in a security role at Celtic Park. Now, again, heading into the game on Saturday, there was a good feel good factor after the performance of Wednesday Easter Road, and then this news broke. Now, again, something we said so much through last season was club having a failure to read the room. Now, I don't know what the position on this is. I don't think they've engaged with any fan group on it. Um, the North Curve. Boys, other fans group on Saturday made a, a very clear statement about it with a 30 minute silence at the start of the game. Again, it's just read the room and not to distract ourselves from off the park because one of the things that shines through is we want positive football results on the park. We don't need off the field distractions that are going to hinder the team, which is something that the club basically created here from Thursday. I thought after a very positive result at Easter Road Wednesday evening. Yeah, I mean, the timing of it is probably the worst. You know, if they announce that right before the international break and give it time to set up before we play again, you're thinking it's a bit smarter. The appointment itself, it looks like, you know, the club are going to take on the Green Brigade or they're bringing in a guy that's certainly had uh, a contentious relationship with it, the, the Green Brigade. So the club must know all of this. So, so whether they're fed up, you know, getting fines from the for it, you know, for flares or whatever, and I've just decided, listen, we're going to bring this guy in to to try and solve this. Uh, I'm not too sure confrontation is going to be the best way to solve it, but it, it definitely looks like a confrontational relationship, you know, move bringing him in. When, when they've done it or when the news has been leaked, it's just ridiculous. You know, we're, we're having a great October. We've won four out of four. You, you know, we've still had a great October, you know. It, it, you know we've drawn one game out of five and one another four, but, you know, it could have been five out of five. It's... That they've got to realise that you know the club and the team were on the up. This could only have been de- detrimental to that. It could never have been a positive thing. It could never have had a positive effect on the team. So why was the news leaked then? Why didn't they wait till the international break? Why didn't they kind of plan this and think, you know, what's the fan reaction going to be if we release this? They must have knew it was going to be negative. You, you, you know, 
They couldn't have expected anything else. So we'll try and control that news. Do it just before the international break, not right before we've got a home game. Uh, when the team's starting to get a bit of momentum, and you can only it, it can only detract from that momentum, uh, you know, which I think it did. You know, whether it's the right thing to have a silent pro- protest or not, uh, it's, it's, I suppose it's up to the, the individuals that engage in that if they want to be silent, and you know, if the, the rest of the stadium doesn't agree, you know, you know, they can make some noise for a for a change, I suppose. But yeah, I, I just think it's another bad move by the board. Uh, you know, we're finding. But it seems to be happening time and time again. They'll just make moves without, on the face of it, any real thought of how it'll affect the team or the sports. Yeah, Patsy, I think it was all about the timing and Lawrence said in this um, and how it would be received. And it really is, in my opinion, anyway, a case of read the room again. It, yes, um, I don't think there's a good time to make a bad appointment, no. Um, no. And it is a bad appointment. Um, I agree with what Lawrence says. Um, you know, Read the room. This is just, it's ridiculous, really. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I remember Neil Lennon saying something after the the flare at St Mirren about two and a half years ago, that all the UEFA fines that we've accumulated for flares and banners and stuff from UEFA amounted to the, the, the value of a player. And I think, I want to say it was half a million that, is that correct? Would I be right in saying that? I'm not too sure really of the sum, uh, sorry, of the sum, but I think that was where the comment was all along the lines of, yeah. Yeah, I know. I think it was under a million pounds anyway, which means you're getting less than 20% of Albina Yeti for uh, all the flares and stuff that we've released. So, with our transfer record, I'm not sure all that money would have got as a particular, a particularly good player. Uh, they, they don't seem to treat money as if it's, you know... They, they don't seem to value, uh, you know, the thirty million Champions League money the same way they do the two hundred and fifty thousand they spend in flares over a ten fifteen year period. Not only that, Bernard Higgins, you know, I think if they're going to take on the Green Brigade, I think they might lose. If I'm being honest, because Bernard Higgins, the, the silent protest is organised by guys who have either had their doors chapped at six in the morning by police officers at the at the instruction of. Bernard Higgins or they've known friends or colleagues who have been arrested and either, you know, I, I don't think the conviction rate was all that high with the OBFA but they, they they had it on their record that there's a file with Police Scotland for hundreds of these guys just for singing songs and I think the whole point of the silent protest was this is what's going to happen if Bernard Higgins was ever to get his way, he's going to just get rid of all the noise, all the atmosphere Um. And, and, and I like what Lovin said there, you know, if people disagree with it, they can make the noise in the stadium because there's 57,000 people in seated seats that can make the noise. And by the sounds of it, they joined in in the silent protest because there was absolutely no noise for the first 30 minutes of the game. Um, and it also just goes to show how reliant we are on the Green Brigade. So, yeah, a bad appointment. Uh, I don't think any time's a good time to announce it. And I'm seriously hoping it doesn't go ahead. Yeah, I think that, you know, the club should engage with fans groups on this and as we said there clearly read the room I think Saturday really you know it's a clear message sent from majority of people in Celtic Park it was just one section of the stadium as you say Patrick I was at the game on Saturday and apart from the deposit chances that we were going forward there was no singing or anything else so um, I think it was pretty clear how all majority Celtic supporters actually felt about this so engage with the fans listen to the fans and I think that perspective will, will come across. But anyway, back to the game on Saturday. Um, one of the blows also from the game on Saturday was Carol Starfield Lawrence going off injured. Um, he's had his critics, rightly or wrongly, um, but he's, he's starting to form a partnership with Cameron Carter Vickers. Going to go to Hungary uh, in two days' time, probably likely that Starfield won't play that game. If it's going to be a while, um, who do we turn back to? Do we go back to, to Stephen Welsh at centre half, or do we? turn again to what we did on Saturday, which I didn't understand and bringing me a beat on into the back four. But for me, beating, I wouldn't have him in the back four. Uh, so either Welsh or, or, or Scales, I think I've said, kind of, I know you, you have different opinions, but Europe's pretty much a bonus for me. So I don't know how close Scales is to being there. He's a left-sided centre, centre-back. We need a left-sided sided centre-back. You know, <laughs> Are we going to give him a chance? 
uh, and see if he can play that position for us. And it, it may balance the team out a bit better. But without knowing how close Scales is, uh, I think the easier decision is just to put Welsh in, isn't it? Uh, I don't think he's done too much wrong. And we've also got Dane Murray in the background who done okay at the beginning of the season that can come in for cover. That not not beating, you, you know, I'm happy to, to see him use kind of defensive midfielder, especially if I try to close a game down and slow it down. But not a centre half for me. Patrick, I know you're a big Stephen Welsh fan. Bring him back into the fold and on Thursday evening, stick him along Vickers and alongside Vickers. And then again, Julian, who we don't know, he's probably <laughs> going to be after the next international break now because Julian just <laughs> seems to keep rolling on and on. I know. Um, yeah, Stephen Welsh for me. Um, I think what we've done at the weekend with Beaton was I think instead of making a substitution and bringing Welsh on, we're able to bring on an attacking player and just move Beaton back um, when Starfield went off. The thing is with Beaton, you know, I, I don't like playing players out of position. And, you know, we've had a four year experiment of him in a cent- central defensive role and it's not worked. You know, he's definitely not a centre half. Not only that, I think just to touch back on the Livingston game slightly, we didn't play as well after Rodrick went off, and that's because he's replaced by Beaton. Beaton usually comes on when we are wanting to slow the game down. We're then bringing him on for a full half against Tibbs and a full game against Livingston. And, you know, to nobody's surprise, we sl- the, the play is slowed down, we're not our usual self, and we struggle. Uh, but no, looking forward to Fenwick Varos. I'd play Stephen Welsh. I'd play Dane Murray ahead of Nier Beaton solely because he's a centre half. You know, mm. you just have to start playing guys in their preferred position. I'd I'd stop the Jovanovic experiment as well. You know, I'd even if it's Liam Scales, Bolingoli or Adam Montgomery, I just think you have to play players in a natural position. Yeah, we'll get on to the full backs just in a wee minute. But Lawrence uh, Daniels came in in the comments saying Sacking of the Spurs manager last night, yesterday morning, sorry, um, means we should go in in January and ask to sign Callan Carter Vickers. Conte's Costello and Callan Carter Vickers will likely not be part of his plans. Um, obviously, uh, Nuno left uh, Spurs yesterday. It looks as if uh, Antonio Conte is going to come in there. Um, is now the time to just go in and get that deal done uh, right away at the start of a changeover, a new manager? Have we not got the option to buy anyway? I don't think Vickers is an option to buy. Jota no. is, but I don't know think Vickers Listen, is an option to buy. If he's not an option, what we've seen for, so far, barring any kind of aberration in the next two months, yeah, uh, it's a move we should, but it looks like we should be making. As we've touched on, you know, Julian just seems to always been close to coming back, but, but never quite making it, is he? Uh, it looks hard for this Cam Carter Vickers. Uh, I mean, and certainly, you know, we've got the, the joint tightest defence in the league. You know, whatever way he's playing, we're Alston, whatever fullbacks he's putting in the centre halves, and Joe Hart, you know, they're limiting the opposition chances. That there's no doubt about that. So, I think he's been probably a huge part of that. He's just got kind of no nonsense, steady, and influence, hasn't he? Yeah. Uh, it's all a big player. Even if he does pick up the odd yellow card for, I'm not too sure what for, but it's yeah, uh, yeah, sign him up if we can in January. Provided he just keeps playing the next two months that like he's been playing. Yeah, I'm a big fan of him. Um, Patrick, you touched there on the, the full-backs. Um, we spoke earlier on at the top of the show about a lot of crosses coming at the box, but obviously from one of those flanks was crosses from a, a right-back playing at left-back. Um, I think you you and I are both in agreement, I'm sure Lawrence is as well as this, that you know, we spent a lot of money on Josip Juranovic, it's probably now time to see him in his natural preferred position. And again, we've got, what is it, four left-backs in the building? Um, yeah. I think it's four. Um, obviously, one isn't in the UEFA squad in volleyball and goalie. Um, is it just time now to, to start playing players in their natural position and just see what you, you've got? Because again, again, like Saturday, um, when you start to strip it apart and take it apart, people will look at, you know, you're playing your right-back at left-back. And persistent, and again, Tony Ralston scored a fantastic goal at Easter Road, um, and he's putting in a lot of top performances. He looks defensively sound, but I think people's worry still is the outlet and attack. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying drop Ralston. Uh, I'm just saying don't play a right back at left back. Not only that, we're also deploying because of Abada's poor form, and you know, 
injury and a lack of options. We're deploying arguably our best player at right wing. And we, we, we've seen at Ibrox, when he was at left wing, just not effective. You know, I know he technically can play there, but, you know, Beaton can technically play at centre half. You know, Kyogo just, he's not a winger, he's a striker. And unless we're going to start playing two up top, I mean, Gia Kamakis can't play in the well, same team. Well, there is, a, there is a debate to be had about Kyogo because he did play a lot of games for Riesel Kobe, I think, on the wing. So he, he did say he can play both. And he's quite well, comfortable playing both. He, he's yet to show it for Celtic, and I think he's done it about four times now. Um, so I, I'm personally just not a big fan of it. Plus, with Forrest coming back, a bad has still been an option. I, I don't think we'll be doing it much going forward because you've also got Michael Johnson and Jota in the left now as well. But yeah, I, I probably would go for Jovanovic at right back, and I think you're left between Scales and Montgomery at, at left back, aren't you, for uh, Thursday night? I, th- I think I'd probably give Scales a chance, actually, because he's only played 15 minutes and he needs to play games eventually if he's going to make it at all. Uh, but, you know, ever since... Uh, I think it was our first ever loss at Ibrox in six or seven years when McGregor was at left-back and the inclusion nine months later. I've just despised playing players out of position ever since then because it, it always seems to go wrong eventually. No. You might not like this, but this is one to throw over to you, Lawrence. If um, it was a case, and we know he shot by the midfield, and there might be a reluctance to play near Beaton in there, Ralston looks quite comfortable when he comes inside as that inverted fullback. If it does become the case that Juranovic goes at right back and the left back comes in, could you see a possibility for Tony Ralston to go into the middle of the park? Could that be something the manager no. tries to execute? No fans of that at all? No. 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 I'll say no just, as just well, no, mate. just to save you the question. <laughs> you know, I, I think you know, we've got lots, we've got loads of options kind of defensive midfield re- field role. Uh, you know, you've got Beaton, you've got Sorrell, you've got McCarthy coming back, you've got McGregor. It's, so, you know, as good as Ralston's been playing, I wouldn't see him as a, a defensive midfielder. You know, he, he, did not, he did another decent shot on target, uh, beat the keeper in the, when they sent one of the, I think, I don't know if they're playing five centre backs at, at some point. It, it kind of come back behind the keeper and was guarding the back post and, and heads it away. But no, nah, I, I don't think we're going to see him as a defensive magnet. Just not. L- l- listen, if Juranovic for me, you know, technically looks a better player than Ralston, but Ralston said some season. I, I, I think if we do play someone else at left back, I think Ralston still keeps his jersey at right back until he does something to lose it because I don't think he's done anything to deserve, deserve losing the jersey. He's, he's scoring goals, he's getting assists, he's part of the tightest defence in the league. It, as you said, he's adapted really well to the inverted fullback. Well, what is it we want to get out and what would they have to do to stay in the team uh, that, that he's not doing? I'm not too sure what he has to do to get in the Scotland squad, but certainly... For Celtic, he appears to be doing everything that's asked of all, all him. And he's one of those players that kind of drives on the rest of the players. You know, Brown had that quality. I think Ralston has that, you know, be his, be his attitude and application. He does drive on the rest of the players. Um, I'm just going to try and check out that Scotland score. So it's definitely not the Philip Lamb, Tony Ralston project in the Tuesday club that's <laughs> getting the thumbs down. Um, <laughs> but, but Patrick, Tony Ralston is, of course, a Celtic uh, Youth Academy product. We do bang on about it. We've already spoken about one who we probably expect to play tomorrow night in Stephen Wells. Um, Ralston is another player who's came through that academy. Somebody who, again, is uh, getting a lot of attention, just there was Rocco Vata. Um, he is, of course, son of former Celt Rudy Vata. He is scoring a barrel of the goals for the Colts in the, the Lowland League. He's just 16 at this moment in time and he's also captured the imagination on international level. Um, we've seen a lot of influx of players from the Celtic youth set up leave the club. Barry Hepburn, Liam Morrison, both respectively to Bayern Munich. Uh, Leo Hielder made that move down south to Leeds and the transfer window just passed. We saw uh, Celtic legend and ambassador David Hayes' grandson, Vincent Angelini, go to Watford. Liam Hughes to Liverpool, Conor McBride to Blackburn Rovers, to name but a few. There's obviously been a lot more uh, in the past that have departed Celtic Park, mainly Lennox Town. Um, all of those players left out playing the first team game for Celtic. Obviously, Ralston and Welsh and Johnson, whatever else, have, have all got that under their belts. What, are guys like Ralston and Welsh the kind of models that we need at this moment in time to say to players, you know, you can make that breakthrough? And again, 
you know, the manager obviously trusted Dean Murray at the start of the season. If you keep putting in the performances and, you know, the drive is there and the clear pathway is there, is that all Celtic really need to do to be able to say to these guys, listen, you'll get a future here and you'll get a chance here? Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't think that means you have to play Ralston in a vital European game, though. Um, no, not at all. Not that Ralston shouldn't play. Uh, I, I don't think it should influence your selection um, in really important games. Um, I think Vincent Angelini in particular, you know, it's not as if we had a plethora of uh, world-class goalkeepers last season. I'm really, really surprised that he never got a shot because our goalkeeper options last season were woeful. Uh, Barkas couldn't get two or three games without a mistake. Scott Bain's not a great shot stopper. And I think Connor Hazard was thrown under the bus a bit, but he wasn't great at catching cross balls either. Um, so I, I'm a bit surprised at the Angelini one in particular. Obviously, if you're offered a move to Bayern Munich, it's hard to turn that down as a 17, 18-year-old. Um, mm. But other than that, you know, I think it is important that we give youth a chance. And we, we've seen that early this season. You know, Stephen Welsh, it's been the last eight, uh, 12, 13 months he's really come into the team. Montgomery made his debut in May. Uh, Ralston's given a new lease of life under Ange. Uh, you know, it looks as if he's trying to get something out of Mikey Johnson when a lot of people thought his career was over. A lot of people still do think his career's over because his legs are made of glass. But, uh, you know, maybe he'll do what he done with Ralston and make him into a half-decent player. But I think a, a club like Celtic, I think you have to have a decent academy because otherwise it's very hard to progress. Mm. Um, unless you're going to have one of the best scouting systems in the world and we definitely don't have that at the moment so I think you should look to improve both of these areas but the academy over the last few years hasn't been that bad you know we've had a player every two seasons or so so if we continue like that we won't be doing half bad and if we uh, keep producing players like Forrest and McGregor I won't be complaining No we certainly won't be Um there's a couple of former Celtic Academy products in the Scotland squad. I'll just give you the highlights out of it. I won't doubt the whole squad. Um, it's the usual goalkeepers. Tony Nelson does miss out of this Scotland squad once again. Jack Hendry, our former player, and Craig Gordon are in the squad, as well as former player Stephen O'Donnell, Andy Robertson, Kieran Tierney, Stuart Armstrong. Um, any other former Celts in there? I think that's all. Ryan Christie's another one. And then current Celts that are in there, um, I think the only... Two, yeah. Do you mean I Cristiano? Can't... I think it's Ryan Cristiano now. Sorry, I forgot about that as he's uh, tearing it up in the English Championship. Yes. Um, the only two, the only two current Celts at the moment in this Scotland squad are Cameron <laughs> Gregor and David Turnbull. So James Forrest, even though he's just back from injury, misses out. Tony Ralston misses out, and a good few others. So that's it. So it's only Turnbull and McGregor into that Scotland squad. Lawrence, how do, how do you feel about that one? Um, it's likely Turnbull probably won't really play any games so the rest of them are, are left back at Lennox Town quite happy with uh, that or? I'm over the moon at that gives Ange more time to work with them less chance of injuries so for me yeah I'm quite happy because I think you know we've got 12 games into the, the season or 12 league games in the, the, the players still need a bit of work on Ange's system and and how to adapt it I think getting a bit of downtime you know a week and a bit is going to benefit that you know, getting some time to work there. Like Callum, you know, just by the looks of like Callum can play any system. Uh, and obviously we're going to, and, and Turnbull's going to go along uh, with Scotland. So it, it maybe asked the question of the guys that are left, who can be creative there? You know, mm. what are our options? I don't know, can we call Rocco Vat up? Because he's certainly, you know, it's goals and assists at international level. He's doing it for the Colts. We're, we're, we're needing some kind of spark in there, aren't we? Uh, so hopefully we can use the international break to find out who can play up there. I know McCarthy played up there early in his career. He's played as an attacking midfielder before. I think he's already getting assists for us in the, the little game time he's had. Uh, it was a cracking through ball. Uh, but, you know, if we, if we can use that time to, I suppose, solve this conundrum, what do we do when Tommy Rogic's not fit? Who's going to be your attacking player? Who's going to be the creative guy there? Uh, it'd be time well spent. Patrick, what's your thoughts on Turnbull, McGregor? Are you surprised that Stephen O'Donnell, who gets sent off at the weekend, um, makes the the mark instead of Tony Ralston once again? Or is it just the manager sticking to what he trusts? 
I think it's just a case of the manager sticking to what he knows and trusts, you know. Um, I know you should always pick your best squad, but we're essentially needing to score one more goal than than Moldova over 90 minutes in order to have a mm. successful international break. Um, I, I wouldn't be opposed to, you know, Celtic calling back all their players from the Scotland squad after the Moldova game, to be honest, because Denmark, you know, I don't think we can top the group. So after Moldova, I'm saying we as Scotland, uh, after the Moldova game, you know, there's no real need. Uh, not only that, I think, you know, Stephen O'Donnell played under Clark for two years at Kilmarnock. He, he knows him, he knows the system. Patterson's done pretty well. I'm big, saying that begrudgingly, but he has done pretty well for the few times he's played for Scotland. So it's disappointing, but it is a bit of a worry for Wilson because I can see Jovanovic taking his spot in the Celtic team pretty soon. So if it wasn't going to happen this time... I'm not sure whether that's going to leave him in March, which is, I think is when the next international break is. Hmm. Well, we'll soon see. Um, so you think he possibly this might have been his chance to get to that squad in the might now? It was a really good chance. chance. Uh, I'm not sure if he's missed out for the rest of his career, but th- when it comes to March, I don't think he'll be in as good a position as what he is just now. Hmm. That is something to consider. Um, yes, so to move on from that... Um, just quickly, again, not to labour the point on this, but it's something that I know Lawrence doesn't mind a conversation about. Bobby Madden was our referee at the weekend, Lawrence, and he penalised Celtic for the same amount of fouls, 10 each, uh, as the opposition, even though Celtic had 85% possession. Very strange. Um, but what was your overall opinion of the referee's performance on at the weekend? Um, I was at the fans' forum last week. The club mentioned that they are looking forward to the introduction of VAR, in the Cinch Premiership. I think you're still allowed to call it Cinch, and there's still a court. Mm-hmm. I think there is still a court case from under that. But um, we'll call it the Cinch Premiership. Um, would that be the answer? Or, again, is it just general incompetence when you're watching some of these performances? Well, listen, he said three out, I think there's maybe 16 refs, and he said three out of our 12 games. He's 25% of a game so far. You've got to ask why does it sell the game so often? What happens to get. Throw to the Rev Celtic. Uh, Short or dry for us, mate, maybe. Good up. Could be, mate. Could be. Uh, but, you know, 10 fouls each. Yeah, he's, he's kidding no one, but we saw it against Aberdeen, didn't we? It was 27 fouls. It's, it's, I don't think he's fooling anyone. You, you know, the stats speak for themselves. There's definitely something strange going on in, in both those games. I think it was the Rev at both at Aberdeen and. Uh, yeah, he was a referee. Yep. Yeah, so was it twenty seven fouls against <laughs> against Aberdeen? Apparently, they committed. Uh, so it's some deal but, but, in the comments. Well, listen, there was no shot there, and as poor a penalty as it was, there was three infringements in the box. The keeper's off his line. Why have you ever got two players in the box? Uh, and neither Madden or his assistant referee spot it. Although we know Madden is aware of that rule because he'd used it on on Wednesday to order a retake. Listen. Whether or not it's a comp- competent or something else, you, you know, it's got to be seen to be impartial. And I don't think, I don't know any Celtic fans that would say that on the face about having a Rangers fan refereeing a Celtic game can be seen to be impartial from the outside. Uh, and I think that strikes to the heart of it a lot. You're going, look, these refs really should be declaring who they support. Uh, and, you know, Celtic fans shouldn't be refing Rangers games. Rangers fans shouldn't be refing Celtic games, and, and Celtic fans shouldn't ref Celtic games. Or Rangers fans shouldn't ref Rangers games. I, I don't think it's anything else. Chat and they say, listen, if we want to kind of at least have the imp- impression of impartiality, that would be a good way to start off with. It. You know, but, yeah. uh, the refing looks poor. No one, I mean, none of the refs get selected for the big tournaments anymore do they so no. definitely the standard looks poor yeah 100% um, totally agree with that one I think that's one of the rules in the, the Premier League obviously it's more professional down there Patty, that people do have to declare what, what club they support um, Bobby Madden is supposedly an Erdogan's fan believe that mm-hmm. if you will um, but yeah, I think that is one of the one of the things as Lawrence says as a, as a recommendation and something else I think um to consider as majority of the refs throughout the league um, all come from the one central part of Scotland. You know, why don't we have refs from Aberdeen and Inverness and Dingwall and other places 
uh, such like um, obviously I know there'll be stuff for travel and all that stuff but you know as much as there's a lot of chat around this you want there to be a good competence of refereeing in Scotland and at this point in time when you do watch games whether it's Celtic or just other games at times you're, you're sitting watching it and being absolutely baffled at some of the decisions that go on them yeah, I think they'll come from Lanarkshire, don't they? Most of the referees, there's obviously something in the water out here on the countryside. Um, you become one. <laughs> not a chance. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if Bobby Madden's real, uh, real team, you know, I don't know who he supports, but how people like Andrew Dallas and John Beaton can referee Celtic games, I really do not know. Um, Andrew Dallas's dad was hit, stuck by a coin by a Celtic fan you can go into the, the rights and wrongs obviously it's wrong you know we're not saying that the Dallas family are all massive Rangers fans but you can't say that he's not going to be a bit biased you know if if your dad was hit by a coin by a Livingston fan you're probably going to not like Livingston much you know it's just it's common sense and then of course Mr Beaton likes to drink in the crown in Bells Hill um, Gets, gets his pints paid from every weekend, apparently. Um, but, you know, how how these guys can, you know, it's not just about refereeing Celtic games, it's about just being impartial in general in, in football and games. And I think there was a conversation about goal line technology a few years ago and Brendan Rogers was asked the question, would you like to see it brought in? And he just said, I'd rather have full-time referees because these guys, they, they have to work 40 hours a week and then do the refereeing on the side. It's they, they need to have full focus and they need to be of top quality. The, the the question of VAR, you know, people watch VAR being used in English Premier League and it hasn't been used properly. It's meant to take something like 30 seconds to a minute, but English referees take up three, four minutes to re-watch and re-watch decisions. It's not meant to take that long at all. Um, but, yeah, uh, you know, I think we all had a bit of a a, a sort of a, a raising of the standards about 10, 11 years ago when the referees went to strike and we got foreign referees, English referees in and games were officiated properly. Uh, so hopefully we can up our game a bit and become a proper football association and get some proper referees in soon. What do you think about Patrick? We're not the only con- country that uh, suffers from this because some of our refs go to ref the big derbies in Turkey and, and Greece and elsewhere because their refs can't seem to be impartial. So perhaps we should partner with, you know, a close by association and fly their refs in for the, the big derbies. So I don't <laughs> know, maybe the Irish Football Association Association we could partner with them and fly them in for the derby and we could, you know, get an impartial ref that way. I'm sure everyone would be happy with that. <laughs> I'm sure you'd have no complaints whatsoever, Lance. Yep, we've got suggestions in the comments of fine people in from the Faroe Islands, the Shetland Islands. Yeah, more than welcome. One of the comments, though, Pat, is this, if you play well, refs can't stop you. But I think the more general chat on this, though, is for other teams that maybe don't play well in decisions and games that we go for them, especially you know some of the teams at the, the lower stages of the league and looking at the league itself, um, a, a referee's decision in you know, some of the nil-nil games that might transpire out um, I was going to say Dundee and Ross County, but Staggies gave them a thumping mm-hmm. last week, so maybe not the best example. But games like that, you know, some decisions in the game can be, uh, you know, a big, big turning point in the game, sending offs, whatever else, penalties. So I think it's a general conversation about how we actually improve, not just from a Celtic perspective, but from the whole league. Yeah, I mean, you definitely can't blame Bobby Madden for the result because we had a last minute yeah. penalty and we missed. Cool. But. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you can still criticise his performance. You know, be just being totally objective, it, it was an absolutely terrible refereeing performance. I thought he left his cards in the house because the amount of fouls he was giving out and not a single player was booked, to my knowledge, until that red card in the 93rd minute. Mm. Uh, not only that, you know, you, everyone knows Jock Steen's quote if you're good enough, the referee doesn't matter. Over a 38 league game period, maybe for Celtic that's true, but you know, for just about any team in a cup competition, a bad refereeing mistake or a bad refereeing performance, it changes your entire season. You know, mm-hmm. if a lower league team is having a good one in the cup and uh, that they're on the bad end of a, a refereeing mistake, that's devastating for them. For you know, attendance, ticket sales, you know, it's it, it's not good enough really. And you know, with VAR, you like to think it would be slightly better, but at the end of the day, 
it's still the same human beings make the decisions. So, well, on your point, look at Albion Rovers. You know, they look like I fell in the keeper a few years back. Twenty fourteen, you know, Billy Omofni, I yeah. remember it well. Yeah, it may have been beaten, might have even been the referee then. It might have been another <laughs> one of uh, Beaton's um, aberrations. But, honest yeah, mistake, you know, honest mistake. Yeah, but look, listen, there seems to be one part of the camp says, look, referees are beyond criticism. We don't need to change anything here. And I don't think that's true. You look at the stats, it's just incredible some of the stats that came out. Why would we not want not better, more professional referees? And why don't we speak to, whether it's Ireland or Wales, other countries out with where we can get refs that would be seen to be impartial? We can share a pool of refs across other countries. You know, our top refs, they do fly, they do fly to Greece and Turkey and pick up fees for, because they're seen as impartial. Because they're saying, well, we can't have someone from this country referring the Derby because they're not going to be seen as impartial. Whether they're impartial or not is the fact that they're not going to be seen as impartial. And I think that's probably, you know, the biggest problem we've got here. They aren't seen as impartial. It doesn't help help it if they go drinking in a Rangers pub after it or if they jump on the Rangers supporters bus for the Salmon Leap or whatever. It probably doesn't help the perception of them as, you know, being impartial. No, it, it doesn't. Um, on that one, Doogie Doogie scandal, if you remember that famous day at Tannadice. Um for the last 10 minutes, um, the Fans Forum happened on Thursday evening. I was one of the lucky, lucky attendees at the Fans Forum. Um, in case anybody that doesn't know what the Fans Forum is, um, a group of Celtic fans meet three times a year usually as the target. Um, club representatives are there and uh, supporters like myself and many others are there to hold the club to account and ask them questions and get a general uh, update on what's happening. The last time we met was in May, pre post um, but some of the, the meeting highlights um, from the fans' forum um, were no tickets for the away game on the 2nd of January. Sorry, no tickets for the away fans on the 2nd of January at Celtic Park. That's obviously the Glasgow Derby fixture. Um, the, the club looked forward to the introduction of VAR. Um, there was no really clear answer on a director of football or head of football operations at this moment in time. Um, Barrafield development is still within the, the sites of the football club obviously they, they said that a lot of their spare capita um, investment was parked to the one side due to COVID um, there are still plans to look at South Stand development a focus group is going to be developed on that because if you do uh, sit in the main stand especially I think if you're a female the facilities aren't great and a stand is well over 100 year old in some parts um, and again the club retained their full focus on the playing squad on the park. Um, Patrick, a few things to touch through in those. Um, just for anybody, just quickly, if you do want to see a more detailed uh, notes of the meeting, check out at Ginty1888 on Twitter. Um, he has got a full thread on his Twitter account um, from the fans forum and it gives you a lot of good detail on it. I think the minutes are usually posted somewhere on CelticFC.com, but you probably have to have a good look through. So Twitter's probably more accessible. But Patrick, um, on that, the, the away tickets, the, obviously the, the Derby game that happened at the end of August, I think, yeah, end of August, um, the reason why there was no away Celtic fans in the stadium was due to um, the fact that the red zones were still in place. Celtic couldn't give a cast iron guarantee that once the game, the return game would come around, that we'd be able to return the favour. Um, it really is time, I think, for, you know, I don't really think this has particularly been a Celtic issue in the past few years, that some people in suits get round a table and come up with some sort of plan here because it is beginning beyond the bazaar. Some Celtic fans might want it to be nothing at all on either side for these games, but for the good of the fixture and for the good of the spectacle and teams that tell what it looks like in the television, it's probably time to get round the table and sort this out properly. 100%, yeah. And... You know, I'm not sure if they think in January would be a good time to do it or not because tensions will be running high and emotions will be running high and, you know, people might upset Dermot Desmond and he might do something rash, you know, you never know. Uh, but I think it's long past time that this is sorted out. Maybe, you know, sometime before the game or after the three-week uh, winter break, you know, get around the table and just agree, look, we both want this to return, let's just do it, you know. Um, 
Did you say it was every three months, the fans forum? No, it's not every three months. It's three times a year. Oh, three times a year. The, yeah. And a few board members are at it, aren't they? Brian Wilson, the interim yeah, CEO, well, Michael Nicholson. Yep, and uh, the finance director, Chris McKay, were, were all there um, last week. Um, Lawrence, what's your perspective on that with the, the away tickets? Is it time just to... Because we've now hit, you know, the bottom level of this. We have absolutely no fans at either... either uh, either game, you know. Listen, for, for me, do you see an agreement it. coming to place? Yeah, I think it spoils it as well. It spoils it, and only probably Scottish football could have a rule that really means nothing. You know, a reasonable amount of tickets. Well, how many is that? You know, it was, I mean, at Tynecastle with no fans, and they says, "Oh, it's because of a red zone." Well, no, no, it still might give us a reasonable. It's not a reasonable amount of tickets unless there's a red zone. Then you don't need to give us any. You, you, you know, it's a reasonable amount of tickets, but unfortunately, in Scottish football, you, you know, that's, you know, up in the air to decide what a reasonable amount is. So they definitely need to get something sorted. Uh, the, the, the red zone thing, I think, is just a complete red tenor, I suppose. It's, as far as I'm concerned, for the whole of this campaign, the opposition, well, whatever stadium, should have been given a reasonable amount of tickets. Uh, obviously, reasonable's up for interpretation. But it would be a strange one if this is where the SPFL were to step in and then say, oh, we're only going to step in for this game when there's been you know, numerous games this has happened already this season and they haven't stepped in. So, again, you know, probably another organisation that suffers from accusations of being impartial would probably be looking pretty impartial. Again, if this was the point of it, to step in. Mm. Um, it will be interesting to see how this one plays out because, as I say, I think it has now hit rock bottom on it, Patrick. Um, one of the also uh, positive things that, that JP Taylor mentioned um, last Thursday is that there's a new contact established with ScotRail um, before when it was in private hands, a bell over, not at all forthcoming and saying um, that, you know, Celtic fans going to the game, they're giving us our money to take them up to Celtic Park. We're not going to make any deal. Why should we do that? I know yourself, you've been over to Germany, um, like myself, for, for football fixtures. And if you have your match ticket, you sometimes get in public transport free. Um, we've seen a lot in the press um, this week, especially around travel, um, with cards being given to, to COP26 delegates to get them around the city better. Um, in terms of the infrastructure, we don't know how that will change post-COP. But on this, I think it would make a lot of sense for Scott, you know, in terms of as well... Um, if Glasgow City Council are really serious about taking climate um, seriously, that there is some kind of deal drawn up between you know football clubs in Glasgow particularly um, that, that encourages people to go in public transport and something with your match ticket, I think would be a definite positive. Yeah, um, it's something that should happen, but I think it's something that's also a long way off because you know the authorities' uh, view of football fans is so it's so filled with contempt that they they probably just don't even care. You know, this would be suggested to, I don't know if it's the council or the government, and they, they just bat it away. You know, no interest. Um, they, they see football fans as troublemakers, probably don't want them to use trains. Um, I, Listen, I don't know. I, 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 I can't sure see it happening. How true that is, Patrick, though, because Fergus brought it in when you bought your season. Season bouquet brought it in for the Hamden season and you got free travel within the Strathclyde region on the trains, whether it was a first team or reserve team, well, we had a reserve team at that time, or reserve team fixture, home or away. So you you, you were looking going, well, there must have been someone there that's, it's been done before, it's just whether, you know, who wants to drive it and push for it. I don't know if Celtic had to make a payment at the time, but yeah. there's well, definitely been appetite for it in the past. Well, anything to get Fergus back in the building, I think. Oh, yeah, can yeah. <laughs> you imagine the carnage? It'd be great. It'd be great. Get him back in, sort of going out. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, do you think he'd come back and buy us? Who knows? I don't know if he'd have the appetite. But it would definitely, I think this would be a very good scheme to look at, and it, it touched base with something that Chris McKay ran, ran through when first Stephen around himself at screen credentials. Um, COP26 is obviously the hot topic, just to be mentioned at the very start of the show. Celtic wants to be responsible citizens on this. They have spent time, um, employees have spent time at Spurs, who are the leaders on this with their brand spanking new stadium. Um, the CO2 output, if anybody is interested, is published annually by the club. 
Um, they've invested 600k recently on energy saving grass grow lights. I think they were about 10 years um, old, and that was uh, an investment made to Celtic to again try and lower their emissions. Um, the disco lights, which have obviously been a spark of contention and debate, were, were again something that has saved uh, emissions coming out of Celtic Park. The club pay a premium for 100% green energy. 25% currently of club cars are electric. They do have a target of, um, I think they went that, I took up about 50, 70% very soon. They're working towards 70% recycling, putting up the commitment to stop climate change and a target of net zero by 2040. Patrick, just to wrap us up on this, um, although the COP chat's going on, 2040 Celtic's target for net zero, is that a good enough target or do you think that could be brought forward a good bit? I think it's more ambitious than the government's, is it not? I think it's yes, three think years. It three years more ambitious than the government's. So, mm. you know, it's obviously a smaller operation. Uh, it, they're not looking at the whole of Scotland, but I don't know. It, it's 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 interesting. I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of, you know, how to transform a football club into a net zero organisation. But, yeah, uh, all for it. If they can do it quicker, do it quicker. But, you know... Obviously, coming out of a pandemic, they've got financial commitments to Barrafield and the such, and the way to improve the team. Uh, it's a difficult one. I, I'm not sure it, that we should be entirely relying on private companies to set their own climate targets because, you know, some of them just won't bother, you know. Mm. Uh, but, you know, 2040, 2040 I think, is quite good because I think the world in general is aiming for 2050. So it is, it's quite ambitious. I agree with you, Patrick. I, I don't care about Celtic's net zero target. I just hope we care about them winning trophies. But listen, if there was more joining up thinking from the government, the Commonwealth Games, the infrastructure was still there, the old Celtic Park Stadium, the banking, i.e. up to London Road to put, you know, reinstate the, the, the train line at that far, but obviously they've done away with that now. So, you know, joined up thinking they've got a stadium that gets 60,000 every second week and it's particularly poorly served by public transport, whether that's, you know, bus routes to, uh, there's hardly any buses going along London Road. And, you know, they've recently brought in the parking ban around about the stadium. It, mm. it can't be good for anyone that's uh, not, not not the best on their feet to, have the, to, the, to walk these distances. They brought in that parking ban and not managed to replace it with any sort of public infrastructure to make it easier. You know, it, it's allegedly a, a climate thing, but, you know, if you're not going to replace it with, proper public transport, then people are just still going to drive. They're just going to park a mile away. Well, you think it's not just Celtic Park. You've got the, the Emirates Arena across the road. So you think it's two major sporting arenas in Scotland. And you've effectively got Delmarnock, Delmarnock Station. That's all you have. Yeah, which is you know, what, almost half a mile down the road. <laughs> it's nuts. Yep. You yep. know. So I think, to, as you both have touched on, I think to try and hit targets like that, again, it's not just Celtic's responsibility on this, it's the surrounding area and the infrastructure that's put into place. But it's a very ambitious target. Hopefully the club are as ambitious on the field with um, targets and in those years up to 2040, hopefully there's a lot of trophies coming back to Celtic Park. But until then, um, we'll be back next week. Next week will be International Week. Um, we'll still probably have lots to talk about. We've got two games before then. Um Usual guys will be back tomorrow to look forward to Phoenix Varos on Thursday. And then after that, they'll be looking forward to um, Dundee on Sunday. Thanks for everybody, as per usual, for commenting. Your comments are always very welcome. It's good to get everybody's chat. There was a lot of chat about Greta Thunberg in the comments. Didn't think I'd ever seen that in Axon, but hey, hope there we go. We're living in a crazy world. Gentlemen, a pleasure as always for joining me. And to everybody in the comments, thank you for joining us on a Celtic State of Mind. 